Okay, uh, welcome uh, to the virtual program of the Adirondacks in 8000 BC. Uh, let's get started. When we think of Adirondack history, we think about the French and Indian War, the battles of the American Revolution, and the various industries like logging that helped to develop this region into what it is today. But when we look at those things on a larger timeline, they've happened in the last 250 years of history, which is amazing, right? Only 250 years and we've become an industrialized nation with all of these wonderful things. But what we don't often think about is how 250 years is a blip on the timeline of human occupation in this region. Before Europeans colonized and fought over this territory, indigenous people were navigating the waterways, hunting for food, gathering and growing various plants, and ultimately building homes and villages, tools, dishes, boats, and so much more. Here in this region, we have evidence that people were moving around this landscape approximately 10,000 years ago. So when we compare the two, 250 years of history doesn't seem like much compared to 10,000. So I want to talk to you about the indigenous people that were hunting, traveling, and living in this region during the Archaic period, or 8,000 BC. So let's start with the basics. What is the Archaic period? The Archaic period in North America was from approximately 8,000 to 1,000 BC. It was characterized by people hunting and gathering, but beginning to live in larger groups and staying in areas for longer periods of time, like a seasonal camp. In the Paleo-Indian period that predates this, we see small groups that are highly mobile. So the Archaic period that follows shows people beginning to slow down a bit. They're still hunting and gathering, but they're developing a stronger relationship with local plants and beginning to cultivate them. What we're also beginning to see in this time period is the development of a new tool set. Some basketry and netting is being made using various plants, while foods are being processed by grinding stones that are used like a big mortar and pestle that you would have in your kitchen today. Now keep in mind that the range for the archaic period is huge. It spans 7,000 years, so these developments in tools and foodways are happening slowly and they're becoming more intensive as they move into the woodland period that follows the end of the Archaic. So now let's talk about our site. In August of 2013, the Department of Environmental Conservation was conducting a survey near the popular beach in Lake George for upcoming road improvements. After finding nearly 2,000 pre-contact artifacts, a full investigation was warranted. For a more in-depth investigation, the New York State Museum was contacted. Three different sites were discovered, but we're gonna discuss the two that were utilized by Native Americans. The excavations that took place here were what we call phase one and phase two. Now, phase one in archeology span is survey. In this phase, archeologists excavated 460 shovel test pits or STPs. These are basically smaller holes and they're used to determine how big the site is. So they're excavated at, at certain increments of space in a grid formation to cover as much area as possible to determine the boundaries of the site. After excavating these STPs, they found that there were higher densities of artifacts near the road than there were near the campground areas. In phase two, the archaeologists opened 45 test units in order to get a better idea of what these sites may have been used for. Test units are typically one by one meter squares, but can be made bigger if it's warranted. 30 of the 45 test units were in the core of the site, which means they're, they're finding the highest densities of artifacts. So the excavations lasted from the summer of 2013 to the spring of 2014. What you don't always see is that archeologists will excavate year round. In the spring, summer, and fall, these conditions aren't so bad, but in the winter, as you can see, they become difficult to work through. You've got to deal with frozen soil. Tents can help, but space heaters were used to thaw the ground so that excavations could continue through the winter. When the excavations were completed, 
they have found approximately 18,000 pre-contact artifacts. So here's a list of what was found, but I don't want you to focus on reading all of it because we're gonna go through these different types. So now we're gonna talk about the different ways Native Americans would have harvested materials, crafted tools, used them, and how they get left behind. And in the end, we're going to discuss how all of these elements help us to understand what this site was used for 10,000 years ago. Let's start at the top of the list, cores. A core, in its simplest explanation, is a starting point for a tool. A core is turned into a tool through a process known as flint napping. The flint napping is when you use another tool, like a hammer stone, which we'll talk about, or an antler, to break off pieces of the core. The cores in this photo are not from the site, but they're a good example. Cores can be different shapes, sizes, and materials, but they are all cores because they're, they're the starting point for a tool. The presence of 49 cores at this site tells us a few things. Native Americans were bringing harvested materials to the site to turn it into tools, and they may have been using a nearby lithic source. Cores are heavy, especially 49 of them, so you wouldn't want to transport them very far. The sooner you turn a core into a tool, you begin to carry significantly less weight. Now, since there were so many cores here, we're really looking at a space that may have been used specifically for tool production. For you all to understand the process of flint napping, I wanna show you a brief video of the process so that from here, we have a better understanding of the tools and how they're made. Now, before I play this clip, I just wanna say that this process takes skill, patience, and practice. So please just don't go out on a whim and, and try this. The edges are really sharp. They can cut your hands. Okay, this is a piece of day site that I ordered online through basically a flint napping supply store. And it comes just like this, just a big broken slab. Now you see that part of it is already pretty thin, but then there's these fatter, thicker pieces right here. And I don't have a particular goal in mind as far as what I'm gonna be making, but I do know that I can probably get this much usable material, this much usable material out of here. So it would probably be a really good spearhead. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take off the sharp edges. Those really are not any use right now. You can't drive into them, so I have to break them off. So I just do downward chunks like that into a waste bin on the floor. And you see I'm starting to nibble away at that. Now I'm gonna flip it over. And I've taken off the really sharp edges. The next step is now to abrade them so that you don't have any sharp edges. You want really nice dull platforms. So I go away from my face so that the flicks and the flex and the little pieces go away from me. And I'm just breaking that down. You can really scrub it too if you want. So flip napping is actually a lot like playing chess. You have to think ahead several moves and you go with the biggest priority first, but you're always keeping other things in the back of your mind. So look at this piece. This right here is already pretty thin. So we don't want to do anything over here right now, but this is a bulb. This is a big thick spot. And so we want to get rid of it. But which way do we want to get rid? Do we want to get rid of the top or do we want to get rid of the bottom? Well, look at the side. We want to break this heavy bulb right here. You see that big heavy bulb? And so we're gonna drive from here down. And right here, this is a good platform to hit. So we're gonna hold it like this and hit it right there. And it'll break off a big flake right here. Kind of the belly, the belly of this clam. We're gonna break this belly off. So I'm gonna hold it against my leg with the belly facing down. I guess that's my own term. And I'm gonna try to hit right on that platform. And I'm holding this against my leg. You could hold it in your hand like this. I've done it both ways, but I'm gonna try it like this because I can really get some good force on it. So again, that triangular platform right there, that's what I'm gonna hit right at the edge. Okay, all of these little flakes, you'll use your own judgment, but some of those can be saved for arrowheads. And look what happened. It only broke off this little bit. We still got all of this belly. So I'm gonna move up here and then try to strike it down to this way. 
So now that took away this one. And now I'm going to bring it back here. I'm going to try to get rid of this. So you're whittling it down, really. But let's come over here and look at what we have. Okay, if I were to hit this, it might break off a good amount, but I'd rather have the platform closer to the bottom where I'm going to be striking. So I'm going to remove this little bit right here off that way. So I flip it over. Okay. So this just went across the top, calling that one the top. And now my platform is down towards the belly that I want to remove. So I'm going to just touch this up just a little bit and abrade it. Watch this. And now you can see how it dips down and I got a platform right here and I'm going to try to take this meat off the belly. So let's see if I can get that with a downward strike right there. Okay, we're making inroads. We got a nice big flake scar, but look at how much more of that belly we have. Can you see where we're gonna go next? We're gonna try to get this. So again, I'm gonna probably abrade that, make it a little stiffer. Okay, I've got a nice abraded platform. This garbledy gook right here, this is a little concerning, but it'll be fine. Um, so I'm gonna hit right here. I'm going to strike down and in, and I'm going to try to blast off as much of this fatness right here as I can. All right, see how I'm slowly narrowing this down? Let's work on this right here. Again, I've got to get my platform a little lower, so I'm going to remove this top part right here just a little bit. And then we're going to abrade it. And now look at what we've got. We've got it starting to bend down towards the belly. I've got a nice platform right here that I can hit. I'm going to try to remove this fatness underneath right there. What I just did was this flake scar. So now we're going to turn it back up. And now. We're gonna work this. So again, I have to bring this off a little bit and then bring my edge down and then remove this little bit of meat. So I'm gonna work around the piece for a few minutes. Maybe I'll do this in a little bit sped up video, but you can just watch as I take this down and try to get rid of all this fat right here. <laughs> uniformly thin wide piece. This is what would be called a trade blank. If this were back in the old days, I would reduce the flint or the day site or whatever you've got at the quarry site and you would reduce it into a blank like this since you're not carrying around excess weight and now you can travel with this and trade. Somebody else can pick this up and of course if you wanted a narrow long blade you could do that. If you wanted a wide short blade you could do that. It's sort of like a Swiss army knife. Okay. So what you see him using in the video <clears throat> is a copper billet. And in the ancient past, they would have used rocks known as hammer stones or antlers. But here, a modern day tool in the Flint Knappers kit is a copper billet. So that's what you see him using. Now that we know a little more about flint napping, I wanna talk about the different flake types found at the site. 
And the reason I have all of these different types on one slide is because they're all flakes, but they just come from different stages of the tool making process. So first, bifacial thinning flakes, it sounds complicated, but in reality, these flakes come from trying to reduce the thickness of a point. These are often long, thin, and sometimes broad flakes that are removed from the core. Broken flakes are the result of being trampled or dropped. A flake can be a really great tool, but it can also be quite delicate. If you drop one on a hard surface, or if one falls to the ground and gets stepped on, it's going to break. Now, next, pressure flakes are removed from a tool kind of towards the end of the flint napping process. These are, the, these are small and they're the result of finishing or resharpening a point. There were nearly 5,000 of these flakes. So what that tells archeologists is that points were being finished, refined or resharpened at this site. Now I wanna tell you what the next three types are together. That's primary, secondary and tertiary flakes. These are directly related to the stage in the projectile making process. Primary flakes are removed early on in the process. They tend to be bigger pieces that are removed um, to turn the core into a smaller, more workable piece. Secondary flakes are a little smaller than primary flakes and they're removed during the shaping of the tool. And then tertiary flakes and shatter, these are both small and shatter is even smaller than tertiary flakes. And these come off at the very end of tool production. So last, you can see here that I have debitage specifically found in float samples. Now, real quick, I just wanna go over this. A float sample is a section of soil that's taken in its entirety to be examined for food materials. Now, archeologists do this by putting soil in water with a net and the organic material is gonna to float to the top. These are gonna be like nuts, seeds, wood charcoal, or other plant remains. And the rocks or flint are gonna to sink to the bottom. In these float samples, they found 600 more small flakes. All of these different categories of flakes are telling archeologists that the entire process of making flint stone tools is happening at the Million Dollar Beach site. So now that we've kind of covered the various flake types, I wanna talk about utilized flakes. These are flakes that are deemed a good size and shape to be turned into tools themselves. These can be used for various tasks. Maybe one is good for butchering uh, after a hunt, while another is really good at cutting plant material, processing hides, or even just used to whittle a branch for fun. There are ways that archeologists can find out what these tools were used for, and one of those ways is residue analysis. Now residue analysis uses a chemical process to see what remains are left on the surface. It can be used on flakes, projectile points, arrowheads, or ceramics. But remember, these artifacts are 10,000 years old. So the residue left from their use may not still be on the tool. Now another less chemically involved method is through experimental archeology. span if you wanna know what a tool was used for, sometimes you have to do the task yourself. When carving wood, for example, there may be a certain pattern of striations left behind on the flake. Through carving wood yourself using a flake tool, you can then examine the tool under a microscope and see if you're seeing the same pattern in the striations. Now, this is certainly not a definitive method, but in archeology, span what you have to remember is that we're creating a narrative for the entire site based on a possibility. These things are hardly ever definitively stated. Ultimately, what utilized flakes tell archeologists is that scraps of flint were used for various tasks at this site. The next tool type I wanna discuss is a biface. Now this tool is just as the name suggests, it's a stone worked on both sides now, what makes these different than the utilized flakes we just talked about is that utilized flakes tend to be used along one edge of the stone, whereas a biface can be made with the intention to use kind of any edge. It's tricky, but similarly to those flakes, bifaces can be used for a variety of tasks. On top of that, a biface might not be what we traditionally see as a tool. The one pictured here is really chunky and large. It's actually from my own personal collection. This is not an artifact. 
it's certainly not in any sort of final phase, but because we've got examples of it being worked on both sides in those red circles, it's categorized as a biphase. Another artifact type found at the site were scrapers. These may have been used to clean hides or shave down wood. These artifacts are unique and archeologists can differentiate them because their use wear is usually just on one side. And I know we just said this about utilized flakes, but these can take a different shape, a different form. Now a sharp edge is maintained here because of the repeated motion when they're used. This is another example of different types of specialized crafting that would have been happening at the Million Dollar Beach site 10,000 years ago. These scrapers in the photo here are an example of what's called a thumbnail scraper. These are not from the site. Its shape makes it look kind of like a thumbnail, especially that one on the top. But you can see that the edge is chipped away from being used. Now the pointed and rounded ends would have been there to help secure the scraper to a handle of some sort for easier use. There's a lot of crossover in these flake types, but they vary in minor ways. Our next artifact type is a spoke shave. For those of you who aren't woodworkers, a spoke shave is used to shape and smooth the surface of the wood. Seven of these were found at the site and these were all stone. This site is 10,000 years old. It would have been unbelievably unlikely that archeologists would encounter an actual shaft for an arrow or a spear. But the spoke shaves tell us directly that they were in use. Arrow or spear shafts would have been used in hunting. So this tells archeologists that people at the site were at least producing tools for this activity and going out and hunting. One of the reasons we wouldn't find an actual spear or arrow shaft at this site is because here in the Northeast, we have a really dynamic climate with a lot of moisture. That creates an environment in which organic material is gonna break down and decay over time, as opposed to an environment like the desert in the American Southwest, where the dry climate day after day results in the preservation of organic materials. We've been talking a lot about tool production and the byproducts of flint napping, but now I wanna talk about the end product. This is what people typically hope to create when they begin to flint nap. Projectile points are pointed shaped stones created with the intention of being tied to a spear shaft, an arrow shaft, used as a hand tool, or even used in ritual contexts. Now, the reason I'm using the term projectile point and not arrowhead is because not every point is used as an arrow tip. Many are used as a hand tool or a spear. So when they are used as arrowheads, they're typically rather small, where spear points can be much bigger. Using the term projectile point encompasses all of these possibilities. At the Million Dollar Beach site, eight whole intact projectile points were found and eight fragments were found for a total of 16. And as you can see here, these would have come in different shapes and sizes. Now, in my opinion, these are some of the most fun artifacts to find at a site. And they give you a look at kind of the artist's intention. Some flint nappers would have wanted notches at the side or the base, while others wanted a straighter base. But the people who made these would have been skilled craftspeople who'd been practicing for a long time. And like I mentioned earlier, this process is not easy and it's really an art form in addition to being a tool. And this is an art form that indigenous people were absolute masters at. So our last tool in the kit are hammer stones. Now you've heard these mentioned already, but let's really look at what they are. Hammer stones are rocks that are used in the process of flint napping. These stones are used to hit flakes off of the core. Now you're probably wondering about how random stones can be discerned as artifacts, but through the process of flint napping, tiny chips are made in the rock where it makes contact with the flint. This causes a patch on the stone where you can see that it was used for something. See where that red arrow is pointing? That is the section used in flint napping that you can see me holding there. This is my own personal hammer stone. You can see the use wear right there in the front. 11 hammer stones were found at the Million Dollar Beach site, which tells archeologists that multiple people were flint napping. 
Could it have been one person using a hammer stone, discarding it and starting fresh? Sure, but that's highly unlikely. Much like we hang out in groups and do activities, indigenous people would have sat around a fire, circled up as a group, made stone tools together, telling stories, laughing, and maybe even planning their next move. Now the last artifact type that we're gonna talk about is fire cracked rock. Who here has a fire pit at home? Do you use large stones at the bottom to create space for airflow? If you do, eventually you're going to end up creating fire cracked rock. The repeated process of heating and cooling large stones in a fire over time results in a breakage of the rock. Now there are several ways that you can use stones in a fire. One way is to use them as the source of heat. If you put stones in a fire and heat them up, you can then place them in water and repeat this process until the water boils, transferring the hot stone between the water and the fire repeatedly. Now you can see com people completing this task in the photo on the right. They're using long sticks that are cut open at the bottom to pick up the stones and place them in the fire, then waiting. Once they're heated, they use these same sticks to pull the stones from the fire safely and place them in the water to boil. Like with anything that is repeatedly exposed to extreme temperatures, a crack is going to form. Now in archeology, span it can be difficult to determine what is a piece of FCR and what is just a rock. Now, one of the major indicators is this reddish hue that you see on the broken side of the rock here. The break and reddish color tell us that this is a piece of FCR. Another indicator of FCR is soil. Do you see these patches of dark soil in the, in the photo of the ground? Soil is altered by a number of different sources. Wood can decompose and cause a richly organic spot. A hole can be dug that results in the refill of a darker color. It can oxidize. Here in this photo, we are looking at evidence of fire. Finding a hearth feature at a site and FCR tells archeologists that they were cooking food and keeping warm. So now that we've looked at all the artifacts associated with the Million Dollar Beach site, we have to examine what it could have been used for in the past. This assemblage that we have here is tool-based. You've seen a wide variety of archaic period tools. It doesn't contain ceramic vessels or baskets, and they didn't find evidence of large village settlements or farming. For the archaic period, this is all pretty normal. This tells us that this area was used as a hunting camp, a seasonal camp, or a site of tool production. And even all of these three things combined. Native Americans would have traversed this landscape and established stopping points where they knew they had access to food, water, fuel, and shelter. Tucked into the woods a little bit, this would have been a safe place for them to rest or live for weeks or even months at a time. The amount of lithic artifacts found at the site really leads archeologists to consider that this space may have been used as a tool production site. Flint could have been sourced from nearby, brought to the site and turned into tools here so that they carried a surplus of the tools that they needed to continue on. Being in the Adirondacks, they would have had access to a wide variety of food sources such as deer, beavers, rabbits, black bears, coyotes, fox, fish, or maybe even moose if they were feeling ambitious. The meat would have nourished their group while the hides would be processed to keep them warm. They would have also gathered wild plants that they knew to be edible through years of learning. They would have told stories around the fire while they flint nap or taken a swim in the clear waters of Lake George. Life looked a lot different 10,000 years ago, but in a lot of ways, people remained the same. They loved and protected their families, they procured food to nourish their bodies, and they traveled to explore new places. I wanna give special thanks to Dr. Christina Reith at the New York State Museum for the site information and some of these photos. I also wanna leave everyone with a reminder that while we know this archeological site exists, it's important not to go out searching for artifacts on your own. If you find archeological material on your property or anywhere else, the best thing you can do is notify the place you are, the place where you're visiting, or the state archeologist. Thank you.